So, without any further ado, um, let me invite um, the first speaker, Mumbeki um, from IFC. So, Mumbeki is an investment officer um, with IFC. Um, uh, he's based here in Nairobi. Um, he's passionate about the impact of agriculture in poverty reduction um, and development and the game changers for smallholder farmers. So, looking forward to his presentation this morning. So, um, investments in um, digital agriculture. Uh, it's always a bit tricky because it's hard to even understand. What is digital agriculture? There's agri-tech, there's digital agriculture. I think one of the biggest, one of the challenges is under, let me see, okay, it's working. Okay, um, is even understanding what this means, and particularly for investments, because when we're talking about investors, we're talking about global investors. Um, and as you know, agriculture, uh, agri-tech, in some markets about precision agriculture. But is that exactly what it is in Africa? And how do we mobilize investors to be more interested? So what is the value of agri-tech or digital agriculture for, for uh, Africa? Um, how do we position it? And, and what needs to be done? Now, the context, I hope I'm, uh, this will work. Um, it's, oh, you point this way. So, okay. Is there a lapse also? That corner, okay. Tech, tech stuff. <laughs> so hopefully, is this going? Oh gosh, or I can just be saying next slide. Okay, okay. That that if that works, I think we'll stick to that. Uh, apologies. So yeah. So in the in the backdrop, of course, um, climate change. Um, climate change um, has affected productivity globally, but more important, it has affected uh, productivity in Africa significantly. Uh, so even as we talk about investments in dig digital agriculture, uh, we have to realize that this is a real issue in Africa. And I think for us in Kenya, we see it on the news every day, the impact of climate change, on, not just on uh, agriculture across livestock and all the things in agriculture. So a very important backdrop. Okay, next slide. I'll be saying that. So the context, as I said, as I started before, uh, you know, what is digital agriculture in an African context? It's not about precision agriculture. This is not about robots and uh, hydrophonics. Um, it's really about managing risks. So, oh, and, and, and quantifying that risk and monetizing that risk is really the challenge that uh, for, for companies in digital uh, agriculture need to really be able to communicate that and to be able to drive investment. But nonetheless, uh, given the crises that are emerging, is it purely a private agenda or is it also a public agenda? So there's also a public agenda that we really need to keep up, be aware of. These are the different uh, risks that are involved in, particularly in small holding context in, in Africa. Next slide. So much easier now. Um, so within this, with, when you look at this busy slide, I mean, if you really want to, okay, this should work though, right? This is the point of the green one? Yes. So um, what you notice here, is that fintech is really at the top, right? This is the, this is, this grabs all the attention and everyone talks about fintech, fintech, fintech and agritech is way down here. Um, um, and this is Africa, right? And, and actually the, the amounts are quite modest. They started at 50,000 not so long ago. Now we're at 95, not so bad, but it's really minimal uh, when you compare um, to, to the overall world of startup financing. This is from, uh, African Tech Funding Report 2021. So, so definitely there's a challenge. We all know how important um, agriculture is, but we all see how low uh, financing. Um, of the 22 agri-tech companies that have raised funding, they're only, they only represented 4% of the companies that raised funding in 2021. So definitely a challenge. Uh, is it visibility? Is it risk? What exactly are people fearing about agri-tech? Next slide, please. So, um, so this is about the kind of investments that are needed in agriculture. Again, a bit more complex than a typical fintech. Uh, you need infrastructure, uh, which may be in storage, offices, facilities. You need systems. Uh, you need capacities, as in staff and, 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 um, uh, and expertise. Uh, you need technologies. Uh, and you also need a portfolio. A uh, portfolio we've seen, um, you know, with, whether it be a Twiga or many others, where well, they stock and they sell, or they actually do financing. Um, but the, the realm of investments in agriculture is a bit complex. And typically this can be funded by either debt or equity. 
But the norm for Africa, based on what we've seen, is typically equity, either because the assets, the number, of, the amount of assets are, are not that high, or so the income is not very high, particularly given the, and when we see the kind of revenues raised by the uh, ag, digital agriculture companies, we can see they're quite low. So also the incomes are either very low or the assets are not quite high either. So let's go to the next slide. So when you talk about equity, so equity is a dominant form of financing for all tech companies, at least we see in Africa. But equity is quite problematic. Equity has issues beyond the company. Equity, most equity investors want to exit an investment after a certain amount of time. So what that leads to is a certain bias because they only, you know, before most equity, before they would ask you, how would you exit? Which, what's, your, what's your horizon and when, how are you going to do it? So typically, uh, the market in which you raise equity is critical. This has nothing to do with the ag tech company itself. So, um, and, and this is about the capital markets. Can you do an IPO? Who can be your secondary buyer? Questions like that come up a lot. So um, companies are going to have to face this, and they're going to have to, either they're going to be based in, in markets that have more equity, and it's not a coincidence that the markets that raise the most funding are markets that have fairly significant larger capital markets. Um, and also, um, also, even when they do get invested, the whole Africa play, also part of creating Agnes, it has its pre pressures. So uh, companies may be forced to expand early um, or be, go beyond a, a certain market, even though they're solving one ag tech problem, uh, then they need to. So equity is, 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 has its challenges, brings challenges that are different um, that, that ag tech companies need to consider and figure it out. While debt is mu much more straightforward, um, as I said, usually it's, it's, it has, it's constrained to the amount of income that the company generates, and it's also constrained to the amount of assets that the company has. So basically, in, in a nutshell, uh, companies are faced, need to deal with equity, but also uh, equity has problems that they need to overcome. Next slide. Um, so coming back to the current context, so um, this is from GAF SS. This is a global, it's, a, it's actually online, so you can find it and look at it. Um, what you see on this slide um, is probably the, the new reality that we all have. Uh, the orange is a crisis. Now the yellow is stressed. Uh, the green is minimal. This is about food crisis. So within this, and I'm not sure what the blank is. Probably there's no data. It doesn't mean that there's no stress in the places that it's blank. Um, um, so minimum green in parts of West Africa. But basically, the new reality is that food crisis, food stress. Um, um, and, and the critical role of agri-tech, as I said in the beginning, is about managing risk and being able to uh, allow not just smaller farmers, but whole food systems to become more efficient. So we need to do different. Uh, I think what we've seen in the past, as far as the m amount of funding raised, uh, will not necessarily be the future. I think this new future is very driven by the food crisis and food systems and making food available for more people and not just food, also nutrition as well. Uh, and how do, how do these companies therefore now position themselves to address exactly this? Um, and who are the funders on this space? Next, space? Next slide, please. So on the part of IFC where I'm, where I'm from, um, um, IFC has now uh, allocated six billion uh, towards addressing global food crisis uh, across different places. Um, this is part of the World Bank's response, which is about $30 billion. Um, and I think I'm not, it's not so easy to see, but one of the areas that IFC will invest is here in disruptive technologies. So, and here, this is a space, at least on our end, uh, we're still exploring. What disruptive technologies can help address food crises? Uh, the, money, the money doesn't seem to be, uh, the money has been allocated. Not, let me not say it's not a problem. But what we need are the solutions that now address the food crisis. And I think given the whole, what we've seen on the map and the reality of supply chain interruptions, and I think you've all heard this many times, fertilizer, fuel, and all those things, this is a new reality. So apart from um, um, agribusinesses, climate, 
uh, infrastructure and manufacturing, disruptive technology is one of the places that uh, is going to be a priority, both for IFC and the World Bank. And the total funding designated for this is $30 billion. So one of the things I, uh, my colleague is not here yet, but he also does this, we are looking for those platforms, those dis digital agriculture, agri-tech companies that are really trying to disrupt the food, uh, food systems to make them more efficient, to make food more available, make nutrition more available. Next slide. Uh, and eventually it's about partnerships, right? So um, not just about uh, you know, uh, the, the equity investors or debt investors, but what sort of partnership, not just attract funding, but also help to scale digital agriculture. Because as we can see, it's still minimal. So um, next slide, please. Here I can talk about some partnerships. So there are two partnerships. One was just launched very recently by IFC. Um, and I'm not sure for the tech companies whether this is a good or bad thing, but Microsoft is coming into this space. And Bill Gates was just here about last, was it last week? So, um, so for, 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 this is an opportunity that I think we all need to think through carefully. To, to see how we leverage this. For us, it's, for us as IFC, it's a way of, of leveraging uh, Microsoft's interest and being able to use that, some of that technology to, to drive um, better agricultural practices. Um, um, but that's not the investment side. So also on the investment side, if there's, the, if there's uh, better agricultural practices, more technology, I think the investments will definitely follow. So this is an area of interest for us. But I also think what Agra, uh, Agra is do doing as well is also quite interesting. Because they're also um, not just developing, they're trying to explore in general the whole ecosystem with companies, uh, but also with the government. And I think in Kenya in particular, the move to transform, at least the, the government um, uh, drive to try to digitalize agriculture will be a key one to drive the uptake of agriculture. So basically, uh, there is some supporting investments, public investments, in other words, that is coming into this space. There is private investment, at least from the part of IFC, we've allocated six billion to try to, to, to address food security. And I think that's, that's the area that we need Agritech to really try to speak to, at least of the, uh, at this current moment. And uh, the question of equity will remain, but I think the key thing is how do we blend the risk for equity investors, or how do we make it easier? So there have been several initiatives to establish green bonds and all. There are several initiatives that can't go in detail now, that perhaps may help address the exit questions for equity investors. But I think key, 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 at least from my perspective and where I'm sitting from, addressing the climate and food crisis is where ag tech should go and where the funding is and where the funding can be leveraged. So um, next slide, I think that's it. So um, I hope I was within my time. Um, so yeah, so that's the thing, and I am available uh, during the session, and my colleague Parsh will also be here. I should have had our emails here, but we are looking to also partner, and also looking to see how we can create partnerships, not just for IFC, but also for other equity investors, or other investors in general, to see how we can uh, help to scale um, digital agriculture to help address the food crisis in Africa in general. Thank you very much. Last week or two weeks ago at the, at the COP27 in Egypt, we launched the CGI hub for sustainable finance, which has been set up to be really the interface between the science we produce within the CGR and the needs of um, investors and, and market participants um, who are interested in investing into sustainable agriculture um, and also digital um, agriculture. So we our work is really based on, let's say, three key pillars. The first one is what we call um, ecosystem level solutions. And there it's really about using analytical capacities and the data we have working in more than 100 countries across Africa and, and across the globe to develop a risk impact framework that is really the backbone of service and solutions we provide to um, the financial system, to financial actors, investors into, uh, into agriculture. One example of that is what we call the 1SF analyzer tool, which is an um, automatized tool that has been developed for investors, for SMEs, to support them in assessing climate and environmental, ri environmental risk related to the investment. But the investment is not only about risk, um, it's also about you know, identifying 
the, the return on the investments and, and the impacts of the investments, which is often what investors are, are struggling to, to do at, at a relatively low cost. So we, we developed this, this, uh, this tool to bring it to the market and, and help reduce the transaction costs of investing. So that's one, one, one level. The second level is we work on the supply side of, of capital. So really working with um, investors to co-design with them investment vehicles that bring in our science, um, our technical assistance to help de-risk the investment they, they, they're making. So an example of that is a fund we, we launched with an impact investor called Responsibility, which is based out of, uh, out of Switzerland and it's the first science-based uh, climate smart food system fund. And with the, uh, as the CGR will be there to provide uh, pre-investment uh, technical assistance to help assess risk, measure impact, but then also post-investment technical assistance to help um, the investee with um, uh, implementing the climate smart uh, strategies. And finally, we work on, on the demand for capital uh, side of, of things. And, and as the uh, colleague from, from IFC mentioned earlier, um, there, is n there is actually quite a bit of interest of investors going into digital agriculture, investing into um, sustainable agriculture. But what is really missing, um, and, and many of you are, are very familiar with that, is often the bankable projects. There, is, there are not enough bankable projects, uh, investment-ready uh, companies that are attractive for, for investors. So we're really putting a lot of effort um, building that pipeline and matching it with the investors we, we work with. Um, ne next slide. And uh, you cannot see here, no, uh, <laughs> sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? Thank you. So um, the, my, my presentation will really focus today on, on work we're doing on, on pipeline development at three levels, really. The first one is at the level of um, tech entrepreneurs, and that's very key, of course, in the context of digital agriculture. The second one is at the level of SMEs and agribusinesses, because eventually those are the ones that will adopt technologies. So we need also to support them in that process to, to, to make them investment ready for new technologies, for new investments. And finally, the third level we work with is more at the country level, designing investment blueprints with public and private investors. Next slide, please. So the, the first example I, I want to give, and, and it's just one example among many we have, but um, working uh, in, in Morocco uh, with startups and entrepreneurs um, that was actually a funded project funded by, by the World Bank. And, and what we really wanted to do there is to identify and work with impact-driven entrepreneurs that have solutions with, that relate to climate risk adaptation, value chain efficiency, uh, market traceability and transparency. So we, we made a call and we received about 350 uh, ap applications and from those 350 applications we selected 10. Um, and those 10 went through an acceleration program um, which was a bit different from the normal acceleration programs that you have which often focuses on the business side of things, uh, helping them you know, design their business plan and so on. But there in addition to that we matched um, the startups with scientists within the C CGIR to help them on the technical side of their, their solutions, right? Which is often also a barrier for, for small startups to have access to, to good analytical cap skills, which they don't necessarily have uh, in house. Um, so, and that nine week uh, acceleration program ended up with, um, with a pitch day with investors to, to match those, uh, um, hopefully, those startups with, with investors. And that was actually it. Um, we had three winners um, Green Growth, Yields App, and, and from Send to Green. Two of them were actually very strong on, on the, you know, the digi digital side of things with real time analytics on. Uh, productivity, Yields App was uh, using AI-based technologies for uh, diagnosis of pest disease and soil health. Um, and, and some of them already, already got some um, investment since uh, the acceleration uh, program. Um, next slide, please. Now, the, the, the next project I, I want to briefly mention is at the level of 
SMEs and agribusinesses. As, as I said earlier, they, they are clients to the AgTech solutions. They will be the ones who apply digital solutions. And we have been working here in Nairobi, but you know, actually looking at SMEs and, and agribusinesses from across the continent with AECF, the Af uh, African Enterprise Challenge Fund, which has already a, a pipeline of bankable projects and, and, and enterprises they have been working with, but they wanted to put a stronger climate lens to that pipeline. So we help them screen their pipeline to identify climate risk and design um, climate smart agriculture strategies to respond to those risks. And those strategies included uh, you know, digital agricultural solutions. So out of the um, uh, companies that we reviewed, about 85% of them had digital agriculture so solutions embedded in their business models, which were, you know, uh, usually related to extension and advisory services, capacity building solutions, market access solutions. Um, and, and so basically we went through that, through that process with again the objective once we have developed strong climate smart agricultural strategy for those uh, companies and investors to match them with uh, investors. Um, and, and, and again that was really based on um, analytical work, climate uh, modeling work to understand the risk, but also working with the investees, interviewing them on uh, designing those potential strategies. Next slide, please. And, and the final project I want to, to mention is this work we're doing actually with, with Mercy Corps, um, and which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, which is much more at the country level. And what we're doing there is uh, for Rwanda and Ethiopia, we co developing with public and private investors, um, investment blueprints for agricultural risk management um, for the entire country. So to, the objective is really to identify where the investments in ARM responses could have the highest impact, uh, including digital uh, solutions. Um, and, and we look at ARM from a, from a broad perspective. So really going from production and value chain levels, agronomic practices, but also advisory services on, on climate and, and weather, financial services, credits, insurance bundling, and so on. So really looking at the entire set of solutions at the country level you can implement to manage agricultural risk. But then the key thing with that project is, is to, to prioritize investments, but also to see where public investments could be best targeted to create an enabling environment for the private investors to come in. Because th at the end of the day, the, the public invest investors won't be able to finance everything. So we will we really need to identify where you know, the, the biggest leverage could be. And uh, that's what we, we're doing with, with, with that project. Ne next slide, please. So it's, it's based on, on, on a very intense um, sort of data collection, engagement with, with the country, with ministries, with, with public investors, um, and, and, that's, and uh, private ones. And that's very important to, to, to create you know, a, um, an investment blueprint that is based on sound basis. And, and we, we do that through a, what we call a multi-level data collection on agricultural risk and agricultural risk management solutions. So going really deep into the regional level, understanding what sort of challenges people face uh, when it comes to agricultural production, um, what sort of so solutions have been uh, implemented to respond to this, but also looking at the national level, what sort of solutions are being promoted by, by the public sector, by the private sector. Um, and so it's based on state-of-the-art modeling when it comes to the risk side of things but also really on high granular ground level data. Um, so we, we have um, um, over the last uh, two months actually been working, engaged with more than 350 people that uh, participated to three days workshops. So it was quite intense and going through all the regions of the country to really get uh, really granular information on what the risk, what the risk, uh, they, what risk they are facing, 
when it comes to climate and what solutions they're already uh, implementing or would like to implement, but also a lot of interviews with um, more than 100 interviews with public and private sector actors. And once we have all this wealth of data on risk and potential solutions to respond to these, um, we're going to go to a multi-stage validation process, again with high engagement with investors, with public actors, um, to narrow down that, that list of potential investment and identify where the biggest impact could be based on data that we will collect on cost-benefit analysis and uh, risk mitigation uh, potential and so on. Next slide, please. So, uh, as the next steps, what we will do is really working with the private sectors, with the entities that have been that could be could have the highest potential in terms of agricultural risk management um, coming from the private sector, and do all, and, and start doing early due diligence, looking at the risk return impact dimensions of these investments, so that we can in the next phase, hopefully that's that's the goal we we targeting really connect that pipeline with the investors and and work with investors to potentially develop investment vehicle to invest into, into this pipeline with potential support from public sector if needed to, to de-risk uh, uh, de the investment. So I stop here. I hope I stayed more or less within the time limit. Thank you very much for your attention. So my job in this little session is to just set the stage for how to think about platforms. I think I was sitting there in the, in the back row in that first session and I think I counted maybe 20 times the word platform was used, but they were used in very different contexts and to reference very different things. So Joshua is going to uh, have the task of taking us through a, an investment platform, a two-sided marketplace that seeks to bring uh, a little bit more transparency to what are these ag techs out there in the ecosystem and what are the investors that are, are lining up to provide different forms of capital. But um, let's start with platforms. What do we actually mean by the term platforms? Next slide. So platforms and platform models in agriculture, I mean, it's become a bit of a buzzword in the last, uh, particularly in the last five years. Uh, but what are platforms and how should we be thinking about them? For the last three years at ISF, we've been doing a range of research and an active strategy work uh, with different platform models that are emerging. Um, we see lots of activity. We see lots of activity, particularly in India and China with some big scaled platforms and uh, a lot of earlier stage startups um, that are starting to emerge in Kenya and Nigeria and, and Ghana. So let's just take a really quick minute to do a, a quick primer on, on platforms. Next slide. When we thought about platforms, we recognised that the actual term is used in three particular ways in this sector. There's digital platforms that are, are actual models that facilitate direct interactions between multiple users for the purpose of exchange. So those are the likes of De Hat and, and Rural Taobao, Farm to Market Alliance, Digifarm, and they're commonly referred to as platform businesses or digital exchanges, online marketplaces. We also hear a lot of digital solutions being referred to as platform models, uh, but as you'll see in the next few slides, these are really digital products and services that are provided directly to consumers or businesses um, that use some sort of a, a, digital, uh, a, a digital system. So folks like Croppen and Digital Green uh, are often referred to as software platforms or ERPs, CRMs. So that's a second type of model to hold in your mind. And then thirdly, we often hear coordination initiatives that are multi-stakeholder referred to as platforms. And that's really for the purposes of bringing people together to create some common ground to um, to think through together common, common barriers and, and broker action. So if we focus on digital platforms, because this is the new stuff, this is the really transformative business models that we've become really used to uh, when we think about Uber and Amazon and, um, and, and companies like that. Next slide. One big distinction to really get your head around when we think about digital platform models is the difference between a pipeline business model and a platform business model. So in pipeline business models, you've got a linear transfer of value. So something gets produced in a production cycle, gets distributed, marketed, and a customer consumes it. 
and the value is created by selling those goods and services through that chain. Platform business models are very different. They create value by enabling interactions. So on one side, you've got producers of, of something, could be a good or a service, and on the other side, you've got consumers. And that value uh, is optimized through this platform, which is an intermediary, to facilitate and drive those interactions. There's a big efficiency gain that can be created through having that uh, platform business model in the center of that interaction. Next slide. When we looked at agriculture, it became really obvious that the emergence of platforms in agriculture is lagging other sectors by a couple of decades. So if you look at the uh, S&P 500, you can see some really well-known platform models that have scaled, uh, Amazon, Salesforce, Facebook, etc. And these are companies that now have a, hold a lot of the market value of those exchanges. Platforms in agriculture, we really have only seen coming to the fore in the last five years in a big way. Um, so you can see uh, some of those brands that have emerged over the last 10 years in particular. Next slide. When we think about platforms in agriculture though, it makes a lot of sense. And we all know this. We all know that agricultural markets are super fragmented, they're fairly inefficient, there's multiple layers of intermediation. And often, there's not a lot of price transparency, which is one of the big functions that uh, platforms can help resolve. So that digital connectivity of market participants holds a lot of promise. But at the same time, and maybe this is why we haven't seen platforms emerge as quickly as in other sectors, there's really volatile prices, there's low transaction volumes, uh, the geographically unique transaction nature of a lot of exchange and highly seasonal trade um, with capital intensive uh, distribution systems. That all creates some really challenging, uh, uh, I guess, challenges for platform models to overcome in making those models work. So we're not going to see the same sorts of models that have uh, evolved in other sectors easily translate into agriculture. And what we've seen in a lot of our work is that even compared to countries like China and India, where there's a lot more infrastructure in place and a lot more uh, density in production, um, the African model, the African platform model, is going to look quite different when it comes to those that are embedded in markets helping to facilitate that exchange. We're probably going to see a lot more agent networks that are helping to facilitate that at the last mile. We're going to probably see some of those platform models tried to um, take on some of those functions that platforms often wouldn't take on uh, in order to make those models work. Next slide. Two quick final orienting slides before I hand over uh, to, to Brighter Bridges to give us a, a little bit of a deep dive into investment platforms. There's a couple of different types. So um, it's important to note that product and service marketplaces are probably where we've seen the most innovation and the, the, the biggest number of new platforms emerging. And these are highly embedded in agricultural value changes, chains. They're helping to facilitate access to services um, or goods, uh, but they're quite different from other transaction platforms like social networks, payment platforms, and investment platforms, which we're gonna be talking about today and innovation platforms which create an infrastructure um, that, that uh, innovators can, can use to develop uh, new, new products and services. So worth, um, worth just holding that distinction in mind. Now, when we talk about investment platforms, we're talking about a very particular challenge and I'm gonna let, um, I'm gonna let the next presenter really drill into that, but on the next slide, I just thought I'd um, put up a quick link, next slide, to a piece of research that we did a couple of years ago that really goes deep into uh, laying out this landscape. So I think you might need to click one more time to show the, the link on the right left-hand side. Uh, yeah, in 2021, we released agricultural platforms in the digital era. It really breaks down everything we're seeing around the world, uh, including how we're seeing some of the, those evolving service delivery models starting to emerge and some of the key choices that a lot of those platform operators are having to navigate. Um, so if you're interested, 
well worth checking out that report and I'm going to hand over um, to uh, our next presenter. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, so I'm going to take a level higher and talk about a macro perspective into how uh, digital platforms can actually help bridge the infrastructural financing gap in investing in digital agri. Next, next slide, please. So um, imagine markets are at a disadvantage, and this is because there is scarce and limited data uh, that talks about the opportunity that is present in these underserved markets. So to put it in context, there's about $5 billion that has been invested in you know, Africa's um, emerging spaces such as fintech, um, um, you know, health tech, and et cetera, but only 700 million has gone into digital agri. Now, what we have done about this, next slide please, is that we are building the knowledge stack to help showcase um, the great work that is in being done in emerging markets in terms of just innovation, technologies that help you know, smallholder farmers and other underserved populations you know, leapfrog the development challenges. So we are behind uh, one of the comprehensive and largest, um, and largest uh, knowledge publications as well as just uh, visual libraries that pretty much help visualize and provide uh, digestible information and data about you know, the opportunity in investing in emerging markets. Now, as part of this journey, next slide please. As part of this journey, we've been privileged to work with some of the leading organizations um, that care about you know, the opportunity and you know, covering and, and just leapfrogging the challenges that are present in emerging markets. So, you know, work with some of uh, the organizations in the room such as uh, CGIR, Gates Foundation, in building uh, the, the, the evidence and data and publications that pretty much uh, showcase the opportunity when it comes to agri and other uh, underserved markets um, in the continent. Next slide, please. Um, but we are aware of the opportunity that is presented by you know, digitization and you know, uh, digital platforms in sort of pretty much uh, sharing the opportunity that uh, you know, is present in emerging markets, right? So that's why we launched Brighter Intelligence in summer of 2020 as a digi digital platform that essentially works in two ways. One, it democratizes access to, to data about you know, emerging markets, you know, showcasing uh, you know, companies operating within these spaces, showcasing investors investing in these spaces, show showcasing NGOs, um, and showcasing hubs and enablers in the, in the, in the, in the ecosystem. Secondly, it essentially uh, centralizes data information um, about all these ent entities doing work in the continent. Next slide, please. So this platform actually brings about different values and different advantages. One, uh, it brings about reliability in the data, right? So you have a trusted data platform that uh, and adds uh, and provides credible data, uh, transparent data that is useful for benchmarking. Um, and by virtue of it being a digital platform, we see value uh, in scalability, right? So um, in, this, in this way, then we are able to see that we, we are, it's easier to showcase opportunities in places that ha are hard to reach, uh, in places that most of the organizations in the room are unable to set up entities, right? Um, in this case, then, you know, we are able to showcase opportunities in you know, frontier markets, frontier states, um, digital entrepreneurs who are building solutions um, in these spaces as well. Next slide, please. Um, and as part of this value, we see reliability in the sense that uh, from a partnership perspective, you're able to collect data from uh, quite a number of ecosystem players and showcase this data real time, right? So you're able to uh, you know, access real-time investment data by the day um, that is, be, you know, being inputted by, you know, our ecosystem partners as well as just um, some of the people who believe um, in the power of digital platforms. And if you want to see, um, you know, this platform live in action, please feel free to join us in the marketplace. I'll be happy to uh, show you the full power of the platform. But uh, this is to wish you uh, a lovely afternoon ahead. Thank you.